Don't you want devoted followers who leave their families for you, give their money to you, give their bodies to you, give up their lives for you, consider you God, and will kill for you? Don't you want to become a cult leader? Since the death of God, there's been a vacancy open. You could fill that void. Here's how. Structure your cult like an onion with the most benign and helpful features on the outside and the most controlling, kooky, and evil parts at the secret inner core. Use deception. Don't tell them who you really are. Offer them something free and get them to feel obliged to give you something in return. You can tell them time is running out and that they must make their decision now or it will be too late. Don't give them time to think. Diminish doubting commiseration by separating your new recruits from each other. Surround them with happy true believers so when in doubt they will tend to do what everyone around them is doing and believe that is normal. Good evening and welcome to The Neat Work, the podcast for all things neat. I'm Theo and with me as always is my friend Dexter. Hello everybody. Uh I guess right into the neat news. Did you hear about this um this what was it? The the Theta Care uh Okay, so what happened was Theta Care files this injunction to prevent their workers from from starting at a new job until the workers can be replaced at the Theta Care facility. Did you hear about this? I did not, but that sounds like total freaking BS, man. Yeah, it's fucking nonsense. And and a a judge, a federal judge, I think, actually said, "Yeah, you that uh you you have to wait until you're replaced." Really? They ruled with that even though it's like totally against like personal choice. That was their ruling. Wow. They received, uh, essentially these workers received a better offer at a different hospital. And this Theta Care hospital facility um, told them, no, you can't, uh, you can't start at your new job until we can replace you. Let's see. I feel like that, that violates some amendment. This is like a form of slavery. Like just, just in case you didn't think that the billion dollar corporations and government didn't think of us as property here you go it just it strikes me as unconstitutional you should be allowed you know freedom to choose really it's people are panicking because healthcare workers are leaving in like droves right <laughs> it's like once we run out of healthcare workers you know things are really going to explode so i guess to a degree i can understand the fear but at the same time like basically indentured is what it is you shouldn't be but at the same time yeah it's like this is a lose-lose situation for the state right yeah well the the nature of the contract the nature of the contract was that at any time the employer or the employee could terminate the employment but now the co- the company is turning around and saying oh sorry you can't start in a new job you could still work for us even if you've quit but uh, until we replace you, you can't start at a new place, even if you got a better offer. So what kind of uh, legal repercussions are you looking at if you just, you know, stop showing up? Uh, well, you've already quit, so I would think there would be no re- legal repercussions. But, I mean, you, you still can't I, work a new job. Like, it, I, like I don't know. Would you be charged a fine? Would you be sent to jail? I, I guess we are in bizarro world right now. Yeah, we're in absolute fucking clown world and because of this ruling i can only see it getting more common i saw a news article the other day that like Uh i just kind of was like oh yeah well i guess that happened and it just goes to show you how like nuts everything is it was something like a a bus in philadelphia yeah a truck carrying 100 monkeys crashes in pennsylvania and now they're missing (laughs) And uh, the truck was uh, on its way to some lab. And I just saw that. I was like, oh, I guess that's happening. Right. We have a new, like, patient zero for something. (laughs) Hey, I think I've seen this in a movie somewhere. Yeah, exactly. 
Wild. And well, like what I'm worried about is because of this ruling, is this going to get more common? It, are is it going to be like are people quitting Walmart going to have to like not work at McDonald's because Walmart needs to replace them, right? True. When are when are big box stores going to start practicing this? Um I've heard of what's called a non-compete clause. I've heard at least one story of a guy who was basically tricked into signing a non-compete clause and he had to completely move out of town because there was nowhere he was qualified to work for in this little town he he worked at. Or 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 like everywhere that he was qualified to work at uh applied to the non-compete clause or something like that. It was so ridiculous. That just goes to show you read everything thoroughly. But even then that doesn't like that doesn't protect you completely. There's that, but then it's like either you sign this thing or you can't work for us. So it so it's like be our slave or starve essentially. Yeah. I mean it's it's messed up. Yeah. I I saw like this isn't exactly uh, current events. This is news from a while back. I mean, I saw a news article, and I'm sure it's happened more than once. But uh-huh. uh, women have been stealing used condoms from billionaires to <laughs> yo, <laughs> uh, yeah, to honestly themselves. That's I mean, if it were anyone else, that'd be kind of fucked. But uh, because they're doing it to a billionaire, I don't have a lot of sympathy. Yeah, it's like, well, he's got the money. What's eight hundred bucks a month gonna do? Yeah, exactly. I don't know why you instinctively choose billionaires, but I guess they're hurt the least by it. So yeah, exactly. At least to some way, some degree, it's like morally gray. I mean, to be a billionaire, you have to be pretty morally gray to begin with. So, so in 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 my uh, let's see, in my book, it's basically them getting their just desserts. I don't know. It's like to a degree, it is like it's wrong. Obviously, right? Well, yeah. At the same time. It's also like it couldn't have happened to a better person. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so yeah, that's where I get more like there's gray. no there's no shame in cheating a cheater the way I see it. Mm-hmm. I don't believe in the whole two wrongs don't make a right. I think it's oh totally okay to wrong someone who regularly wrongs other people. But three left turns make a right turn. That's true. Three lefts do make a right. <laughs> <laughs> um in, in other kind of neat news, it, it just seems like every other month there's another big crypto crash. Uh, the value of Bitcoin, Ethereum, right. and all the big all the big cryptos are absolutely crashing. And I want to say this is probably because of um, Bitcoin took a massive dip recently. That's right. Yeah, I want to say this is because of Omicron, but everything's being blamed on Omicron. So who even knows? I stopped paying attention to crypto a while ago. Now this is just my theory. You know, uh-huh. me being a, a schizo. Every time it crashes, I almost am like. 60 percent certain it's some kind of government plot man i mean at this point i wouldn't even be surprised like they gotta somehow lower the value of crypto so that they can like invest in it in mass and then like it just explodes exactly. in value and then the government again they'll start talking about like regulating it which causes it to dip again and uh-huh. then well, billion dollar corporations do that with the stock market and with the real estate market. You know they're in crypto. Yeah, but senators are only supposed to have a two hundred thousand dollar like salary, you know? Only two hundred thousand a year. Yet somehow they're all like like multi millionaires. Right. Something ain't added up, Chief. Uh huh. That is an interesting point you bring up, or at least that you kind of remind me of. It's are you getting the the impression that normies are kind of waking up to the normie lie? I don't know. This might just be the common sentiment in the United States right now, where people are just kind of hating on, you know, working because working sucks. But I don't necessarily think it has anything to do with people waking up. Well, I'm getting an impression that people, not just in America but all over the world, are really starting to stop trusting in their governments yeah um i think that's because it's super people are people are waking up to the idea that their government really doesn't have it uh have their best interests at heart well it's definitely partially because every government is sleazy as hell but also because we've been in like what two and a half years of lockdown now there's that too it took a disaster like this to wake people up right to shake them awake but I guess kind of related to that idea, this this article I found 
in relation to today's episode is pretty old, but it's uh it's entitled Workism is Making Americans Miserable. Have you read this article? I have not. All right. Well, it's it's uh it comes from The Atlantic. It's when when was this article published? Let's see. Oh, uh, it's not that old. It's back in 2019. February 24th, 2019. So it's a, it's a few years old, but I think it, I mean, it's still relevant to what we're talking about, especially today. Uh, A quote from the article that kind of sums it up. The idea is the decline. This is from the article. The decline of traditional faith in America has coincided with an explosion of new atheisms. Some people worship beauty. Some people worship political identities and others worship their children, but everybody worships something and workism is becoming the most potent of the new religions competing for congregants. What do you think of that? So actually, I have a lot of friends who I feel like are married to their jobs. Yeah. Oh, and yeah. I've used that term a lot. That It's like, don't get married to your job, but it it's just how it is for a lot of these people. Absolutely. There is this idea that, um, especially in the West... It, I guess in Asia too, but to a lesser extent, maybe just maybe the maybe this is more of a first world thing where your job is more important than your family. Um, if you're sick, you should uh, if you're sick, you should go to your job anyway, even if you're contagious. Um, if you're if you're if, a, if someone, you know, is dying, you know, don't take any time off of work because it's not a big deal. Just go to work and be productive. I think I think that idea has really wormed its way into the consciousness of normies. Um, for sure. I mean, there's uh, one of my friends. She's kind of fallen for the working woman. Oof. The boss babe stereotype. Like not even that, just the independent working woman. Right. And it, it's good for her and everything, but at the same time, like she's kind of lost her, uh, her social life. So to speak. She's brainwashed herself anyway into this cult of work. I guess this kind of brings up the next question of, is it really right for us to uh, criticize this if people are getting enjoyment out of it? Like if they find fulfillment. If if they are truly getting fulfillment and they're not like trying to indoctrinate others into doing it or like guilt others into being good little worker drones... I'm not sure I see that much of a problem with it, but the but the problem I have is that our culture is so work oriented that if you it's don't like, have a job, you're basically seen as a villain. Yeah, but like what? You don't have a job, so you're just a leech on society. You're just a leech on society. Yep. Well, I will say to some extent, I follow a similar ideology. Okay. I won't say like downright the same because if you're making money to some degree, making money move. Right. The, the, to me, that's the equivalent to a job. You're making money somehow. But when you're not doing any of that, when you're not working, when you're not making money move, mm-hmm. and you're somehow still acquiring funds. I think there's a difference between uh, not working and being a burden on other people. Yeah. So, like, being a leech is very different from uh not working right right because being a leech means that you're just straight up sucking up money from others Mm -hmm. or or just resources in general like uh like uh we talked about chris chan right chris chan is absolutely a burden on the i mean even (laughs) now now he's a burden on society but uh back when he was just regular old chris chan and, and none of that wild stuff recently happened um he was just a burden on his parents Right well, now, he's the next coming of Christ. Yeah, apparently, he, he he's, he's somehow simultaneously like a computer goddess from the Neptunia franchise, but also Jesus Christ, but transsexual. And uh, I think there was like and one more thing he worked into his like personal religion, re- rewriting all of the commandments to yeah, yeah. his lifestyle. <laughs> yeah, getting back to the thing, um, what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I think there is an important distinction between being a leech and being a uh, non-working, but there's also a uh, important distinction between an obnoxious workist and a exactly who just loves their job. Right? Uh-huh. And and culturally, I think we lean toward that latter statement: is that uh, we we believe everyone should have a job, 
even when there aren't enough jobs for everyone to go around, even when most jobs that exist are just bullshit busy work jobs. Um, another statement from the article. Uh, I mean, I, maybe this kind of relates, but another statement from the article. We've created this idea that the meaning of life should be found in work, says Oren Cass, the author of the book, The Once and Future Worker. We tell young people that their work should be their passion. Don't give up until you find a job you love, we say. You should be changing the world, we tell them. That is the message in commencement addresses, in pop culture, and frankly, in media, including the Atlantic. I will definitely say that surely that doesn't put pressure on people, but um, absolutely. at the same time, how many factors have to line up for you to truly enjoy your uh, your work, right? Right. Like, it feels like I worked my entire life to do something I wanted to, and then the stars just didn't align. <laughs> yeah, well, like, like how many, how, like, how often do people really go into something that they truly love? Uh, moreover, how many, how many people, like, follow the normie path and go into a job they truly love, right? So few. Almost, almost all of the stories about someone who pursued their passion were people who, like, quit their job and pursued their passion on their own time, taking on that risk for themselves. You know, we, we talk about Eric Baroni. Chris Chan. Chris Chan, uh, to an extent. Um, uh, I've been thinking about it. There's an awful lot of, like, guys who quit their, their jobs to become video game developers and ended up becoming millionaires. We could do, okay. like, several episodes, but I don't want to do it, do, do, do it for, like, every single person who's done that. We're just going to maybe briefly mention it in a few episodes. It's... There's so many good ideas that can never be uh, brought to fruition because I mean uh-huh. I've definitely talked to my coworkers about this. Where by the time I get home, I'm just tired. I want to lay down. I'm done for the day. I'm burnt oh, out. Oh yeah. There's definitely a uh, this notion that like just because you're awake, um, you you obviously have the energy to do stuff. But what people don't realize is work is extremely draining. Even if you do nothing, being bored takes an ex- surprising amount of energy. There's something very shackling uh-huh. about going to work every day at, you know, X time in the morning until X time in the afternoon, and maybe not necessarily working the whole time. Granted, these last couple of weeks have been, like, nonstop for me, but still. In, in relation to this article, like, I guess I picked a kind of old article, but I think it relates to the episode of, uh, the subject of the episode. And as we've been doing this podcast, I've had a couple uh, discussion. I've had a couple discussions with normies, mostly my mother, um, that show that these people, normies, I'm, I'm talking about, absolutely refuse to see what is right in front of them for one reason or another. You know, I, I talked to my mother about how, like, the uh, among all people who receive government assistance, it's Walmart employees who receive government assistance. But she says that's somehow okay. Uh, like, and my point being that Walmart doesn't pay their employees enough money. And she says, that's fine because they can just get on government assistance. And if I tell her if Walmart actually paid them fairly, they wouldn't need government assistance. You know, those government handouts you hate so much, but she just refuses to see it. And it gets me wondering, are normies a cult? The way they just dismiss piles of facts right in front of them, readily observable, is very brainwashy. What do you think? I think that might be a bit of a slippery slope statement. Yes, it is a little bit odd that, like, oh, government assistance is wrong unless, you know, so-and-so conditions have been met. At the same time, it's they're trying, so, like, at least to some degree they could get it. That's, but at the same time... Just an example. That's just an yeah. example. There's there's tons of, uh, it's mostly, like, boomers and Gen Xers who, who, uh, basically never ever question the norm and are as morpheus might put it so inured by the system that they will fight to protect it again it's a different timeline right they were in the timeline where you know a thousand bucks was a lot of money but the uh 800 bucks they get from aid is you know life-changing to some people uh and to some degree they came from the timeline when it was viewed as welfare being a hand up instead of a hand out, right? Yes, yes. And the 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 perception of of welfare and quote unquote government handouts has definitely changed over time. 
even when corporations receive much larger government handouts, but somehow it's not wrong when they get it. Right. I'm not sold on them being a cult. I am being a little hyperbolic when I say a cult, but we live in times of hyperbole. <laughs> Um, and the, the trouble with labeling anything a cult is that, one, every cult is a little bit different from the next, and most of the time, a cult won't even refer to itself as a cult. I would take a step back from cult, like one step back, and say it's an ideology. Ideology? Okay. I'm going to keep saying cult. <laughs> <laughs> whatever, um, uh, whatever suits your narrative, man. Yeah, yeah. Well... Uh, you get these you get these fedora tipping redditors who claim well every religion is a cult but that's pretty much nonsense most cults yeah well at this moment i'm euphoric yeah <laughs> am... are you enlightened by your own intellect yeah i'm enlightened by my own intellect see see the thing the thing about the whole every religion is a cult statement is most cults aren't even religious in nature uh even if that's the stereotype but cults do have a number of traits in common and what we're going to do is use this episode to examine those traits and maybe determine one way or another if normies are indeed a kind of modern widespread cult. And when I started writing the episodes, I was kind of going by like individual traits of cults, but the list just went on and on and on. And this is probably going to be a pretty big episode. And I found what is called the bite model of determining a cult. Uh, basically, if you're examining a cult on the bite model, you can apparently reliably determine a cult if they hit most of the traits outlined in the model. I think the bite model does it best because it takes these traits of cults and kind of boils them down to a simple concept. And that concept is what is the cult trying to control in its members? What do you think of that? I think that we are getting to a degree where businesses are attempting emotional control on people. Uh, right. I think it was posted in our Discord recently in the meme channel, granted, but uh, it was basically an article title, something along the lines of like, uh, let me see if I can find it. I can't find it, but it was basically McDonald's was telling their employees to stop complaining because 10 minutes of employees releases like increased stress hormones, which causes more... Uh, which causes more complaining. Uh-huh. Uh, there's the whole we're a family narrative that a lot of companies have. Uh, we talked about that last time where they'll they'll basically manipulate you into thinking that they are open and welcoming, but when, when the rubber hits the road, they're just as, as ruthless as every other company. They're just as cutthroat. And it only goes one way. You're expected to be a family member to them, but the other the, going the other way, it, it's all business. Yeah, I hate the business as a family approach anyway. Like, what is that called? It's a corporate Stockholm Syndrome. Yeah, well, Stockholm Syndrome is... That is a, an interesting thing. We may have to examine that. We we may get into it in this episode. Stockholm Syndrome is like you begin to sympathize with your captors. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're kidnapped or... Uh, well, pretty much if you're kidnapped or abused in some way... Um, you you begin to like sympathize and even like fall in love with your captors, and I I absolutely think that happens in the corporate world. Oh yeah, definitely. There is that corporate Stockholm syndrome. Where it's like they really do take care of me, right? You know they they really care, and you look at it, and no, they don't. They just have to give off the uh, appearance that they do to get you to work more, right? Right. It occurs to me that uh, the last episode, we forgot to give uh, the shout out to our Patreon supporters, and we still have the one. So uh, thank you, Kyla, for your $10 Patreon donation. Um, but for anyone else who wants to receive a Patreon shout out, you can go to patreon.com slash the network pod to uh, donate as little as $1 to support the network. Your contribution goes toward things like paid promotion, guest appearances, and membership to various podcasting services. So the bite model is about what the cult controls in its members. The bite is an acronym, and the B stands for behavioral control. And not going to lie, most organizations implore their members to behave a certain way, and it's, it's pretty much how society itself, itself works. 
But cults will bend this to an unreasonable degree. And what I did was I took some, there's essentially a big list of like what each bite model aspect is. And I kind of broke it down into what I've seen the normie cult doing and some things that they might not do. And here, here, here's what I've seen the normie cult doing. One, promotes dependence and obedience. Or how often are wages told to work on a holiday to turn away from their family and friends in the name of loyalty to the company? We were, we were literally just talking about this with the whole, our company is a family thing. Right. My company, I'm an employee who's only expected to come in X number of days. Uh-huh. But with someone who's above me out right now, I'm going to be expected to fill in his shift as well. Oh my God. And there is no, like, are you okay with this? It's just expected. Yep. It's just expected of you. Right. It's like, well, things still got to go out. So yep. like, you're going to do that, right? It's all in the name of being productive. Exactly. Uh, next point, deprive you of sleep. And this is what I've personally experienced. Um, maybe you out there have been scheduled for a closing shift and then immediately after you have to work an opening shift. Like you're only, you're not even necessarily given eight hours between, uh, shifts. It's like, it's like they expect you to teleport home, immediately fall asleep and then wake up, be ready and then teleport back to work. So you're not even given enough time to really rest between shifts. Has this ever happened to you, Dexter? I think that this is particularly common for kind of early in their career people because uh-huh. the job I work has a set schedule. Right. Where I, you know, I go to work every morning at like six uh-huh. and I leave at four thirty every day. And that is just my schedule. For people who maybe work in fast food or work in you know, not necessarily career jobs, I would say that that is way more common. As for me, I only experienced that in my first job, which was lifeguarding. Okay. It's definitely common in the service industry. Both of the retail jobs I worked, um, I was scheduled for like back-to-back opening and closing shifts, sometimes without enough hours to uh, to truly rest between them. I think that might be a a side effect of the fact that You know, it's low-skilled workers, right? It's like, well, if you don't like it, we'll just find someone else. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely what it is. Uh, If we can replace you, if you're not going to to shape up and uh, be our little worker slave. They are easily replaceable, whereas as you get more specialized, you kind of get a set schedule. I don't want to say it's the worker's fault, but to an extent, this does fall back on the employee as well. Or, you know, the employer could just not abuse the employee or that. That is an option. (laughs) option. But let's not be unreasonable. (laughs) All right. This, this is a pretty common one. Control clothing and hairstyle. Okay. That one actually does apply to me. Really? Okay. Most of the time I can kind of wear like, you know, just graphic tees and things I can do. Mostly right. what I want within reason, of course. Um, and it's it's within the context of work, right? If, if you're at work, it's you you should wear like maybe a uniform. Yeah, I'm not forced to wear a uniform, right? But when we do have things like customers visiting, I am expected to wear like a nice, respectable set of clothes. Yeah, and and I can I can understand this um in the context of work. If you're on the job and this is uh, this really the only reason I included it is because they're making you do it on the job. I can't say I've ever heard of a of a job like telling you when you're off the job you have to dress and wear your hair in a certain way. Um I know okay, I have really I've experienced a job that basically told me like granted it was my work has to be it can only be so long at its longest. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm not allowed to have any facial hair. I have to shave it every day. Ooh, whoa. And, you know, things like that. I've uh-huh. definitely had jobs like that. As for expecting you to wear certain things, I don't really blame the job for this one. Is this outside the job or? No, this no. is inside the job. Okay, yeah. Inside the job, I get it, right? Yeah, it's like, okay, this is your business. You want me to look respectable? Yeah, I think I think when it 
when it starts reaching outside the job, it becomes more cult-like. Right. When, you know, you got your boss patrolling your Facebook, looking at what you're wearing at yeah, the sport. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure, uh, you know, it's, I want to say, like, women might face that more now that I think about it. Like, uh, say their creeper boss is creeping on him on Facebook and be like, hey, you were wearing something inappropriate at, at your event or whatever. I could absolutely see that happening to a woman. You were wearing that, weren't you, you dirty girl? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> God. <laughs> Do you need you need a daddy to set you right? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> All right. Next next point. <laughs> Exploit members financially. And the way I see it, any ultimatum that is that boils down to work for me or you will be homeless is exploitation on top of paying employees for far less than what they actually produce. Okay. And that's about it. <laughs> I think that's like the biggest complaint for literally any worker in the United States, right? Yeah, pretty much. Is uh you don't you never make enough. I I hear about um something called wage theft. I've never personally experienced it, but it's like sometimes uh let's see. I I've I think this counts as wage theft where if you work for tips, your boss like essentially steals your tips. That's one form of wage theft. Or sometimes your work just flat out refuses to pay you. I've heard about this in fast food. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Where it's like basically like, oh, hey, your wages or your tips that you make are part of your wage, right? Yeah, that that's definitely that's fucked. That's disgusting. You lose wage per tips or something like that. Uh-huh. Well, it, it's uh, restaurants can pay less and they justify it by saying that the waiter can make tips exactly in effect it's panhandling because now you're dependent on the goodwill of other people and i guess if we don't have much else to say we can just move right into the next point um which is restrict leisure time and activities and again this this kind of goes back to the idea that employers are telling their slaves to work on holidays um denying them earned vacation time I've personally been made to work around two and a half weeks with no day off whatsoever. Um, I wasn't even allowed to do my weekly chores necessarily because I had to, I was constantly having to get ready for work. It's like, Hey, I got to go and buy groceries so I can eat at night. (laughs) Yeah. But then, but then like, uh, it's like, do you cook, do you have enough time to sleep and cook dinner or buy groceries, but you can't necessarily do all three. Oh, and you're opening and you're opening tomorrow too. I guess the way I was interpreting this was like you're expected to work a uh, and then only take like two 10 minute breaks, right? I, I guess like, yes, you're only expected to take 10 minute breaks. Um, you're not allowed to go to the bathroom in some extreme cases. Um, bathroom breaks are limited to your 10 minute break, stuff like that. I was thinking like when your your time off work is being exploited by the employer. So like your holidays or your vacation time, you may have racked up a bunch of vacation time, but now you're not allowed to take that vacation for whatever reason. In a lot of cases, I see that someone has racked up so much vacation time that if they don't use it, they start to lose it. Yeah. So that actually does happen at some places I've been at before. Uh where They will uh, basically tell me like, hey, you need to take days off. Otherwise, you're not going to get it. And I know in the military. Granted, it keeps accumulating forever, but in the military, they tell you basically like, hey, you should be taking days off. But then when you go and ask for it, you don't even get any off like they just can't grant it for you. Yeah, they'll just they'll just flat out deny it. And that happened to me multiple times uh, when I was in the Air Force, except the very last time when I was getting out. I had like I had almost my two month cap. And I basically just took the last two months off and I <laughs> I sat on my buddy's couch for two months straight and just played Skyrim for by the months. Time I was, by the time I was ready to leave, I was actually a part of the couch. They had to cut me away from the cushions. <laughs> right? <laughs> their cat, their cat like learned that um, the way I was kind of sitting, my arm was up on the, the back of the couch and their cat learned that if she sat like on the couch right there, I'd ever, I'd every so often move my hand away from the mouse and give her a scratch. Mm-hmm. So that became her perch. <laughs> I guess uh, it kind of related to this uh, denial or approval of taking vacation time is require permission for major decisions. Um, and 
this has this has never happened to me. I know this happens to women a lot where work is not interested in things like I have a baby and need to take care of it or like I have to take some time to move to a better place because they jacked up my rent and I can't now can't afford to live there. They're not interested in that. That's something you have to do on your off time or take vacation time to do it. I think it I think it depends on the place again cuz there's definitely like I'm pretty sure there are even laws for maternity. Yeah, there are there are uh, at least in America there is maternity leave, but most first world countries actually have parental leave for both parents. Oh, well, that would be nice. Yeah, right. I know as a a dude if I ever had a kid, I would, you know, Absolutely. really like to have yeah. two months. Mhm. I've heard at least one story about a woman being encouraged to get an abortion uh by her boss so she could continue working. Isn't that fucked up? Yeah, that's super messed up. And there are some other traits on the, the list of behavioral controls, but I had a harder time determining how they might fit into this category or thinking of examples. Maybe you can think of some, Dexter. Modify behavior with rewards and punishments. Okay. Um, I think this is just a common business strategy, isn't it? Like, there's the incentive programs, right? Okay. If you, say, like, help the business earn X number of shekels extra every year. Right. Okay. Yeah. Meeting your quota. Um, maybe like the idea of dangling a raise uh, at, in your face, like a carrot. Yep. Mm-hmm. Okay. That, that one's probably the easiest, but uh, maybe at the time of writing this, I couldn't really think of some. How about dictate where and with whom you live? I've never seen that. Yeah. I can't say I have either. I've heard of, um, I've heard of companies contacting roommates, but never telling you you couldn't live with certain people. Yeah, I guess it to a degree has dictates where you can live, but that's only because you have to be within like a driving distance from your job, right? Right, right. Um, okay, next is restrict or control sexuality. I can't say I've experienced that either. Yeah, me, me neither. And the last one, regulate what and how much you can eat and drink. And I can kind of I can kind of say an example for this one, but this is Japanese culture, and it's like the idea that um drinking is very prevalent in Japanese business culture that it's often expected that you'll go out drinking with your boss after work Mm -hmm. and you have to drink because it it shows solidarity. Right. But as, as far as like um, Western businesses, I don't think I see that so much. Yeah. I I can't say that any of these really apply. Yeah, exactly. And that's why they're here. Of course, there's always going to be that toxic business, right? That, Right. I, I could definitely see like a vegan boss enforcing like a vegan rule or something in there or or like a, a saying people can't be vegan or something. I, I could absolutely yeah. see that kind of yeah, situation. Like w- really weird kind of people who like pick sides. You got your like primal carnivores versus your vegans. You know, things like that are like whatever, man, just let them eat what they want. It doesn't hurt you. Bosses who have to like micromanage your personal life. Okay, I've actually I have seen something like this. Now I think really about it. okay. Uh, granted, it wasn't necessarily. I guess it was kind of a job for the people involved. Basically, one of the like flagship trips to like the Arctic. They're trying to go around the Arctic Circle or whatever Arctic Sea in a sail ship. Yeah. Uh, like right before winter froze him to death, and the captain was vegan. <laughs> he didn't tell any of his crew about it. So when they all got there and they left, oh, wow. they found out that they only had vegan foods on board. Oh my god. And basically the captain told him, like, that's it. That's all you guys get to eat for the next X number of months. Yeah, ouch. Like, I don't want you catching any fish or anything like that. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, Should I mention military examples? I, I want to say the military is kind of a, a separate thing, but should I should I mention some of my experiences in the military? I think to some degree it applies, correct? Yeah, I I just remember like in the military there's a lot of like shame for doing things, but they'll never like tell you no, you can't go eat Popeyes, but uh, I I know I was often shamed for getting fast food in lieu of going to the chow hall. Um that's that's my experience, but uh they never they never like told me no, you 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 couldn't do that. It was just like, "Well, why'd you do that and not eat the shitty food at the chow hall?" Because I wanted a Subway sandwich, asshole. But you have more stripes than me, and I can't tell you that. (laughs) 
you just can't tell uh, without getting like push ups for the next thirty hours. Right. Next up on the bite model is how a cult controls the information its members receive. And this, for me, this is a tough one because technically you're not banned from any information, but I can certainly see how some sources, I can certainly see some sources of information being frowned upon by normies. I think if we take this within the scope of a company, I know for a fact that I've been black boxed from a lot of the discussions. Really? Things that definitely affect me. Interesting. Okay. So so would you say that kind of falls into this first one, which is deliberately withholds and distorts information? If I was to say that's the case, it would definitely be something along the lines of like that end of the year briefing that you get from your coworkers. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Or from your, your boss that basically says something along like it frames your bad numbers for the year in a good way. Yep, yep. We had those in the military too. It's like you uh you did like fifty percent less than last year, but it's like they don't want to mention that to cause a panic and cause like a mass leaving, so they say something along the lines of like They spin it in such a way that it's like, hey, we actually did lots of business if you if you're looking at it this way. We worked really hard. Yeah. And yeah, something like that. And and maybe like the practice of oh, you have all this vacation time, but we won't actually let you take it might apply to this too. Um, the the example I have is businesses regularly ban the discussion of salaries, even if it's illegal. Um, and secondly, with American normies in particular, maybe it's less so among younger Americans, but definitely among older Americans, there's this idea that like learning about other countries is frowned upon because America's the best and why even learn about those other countries, despite the fact that in almost every metric, America comes in dead last. What do you think of that? At least among first world countries, I should say. The The example I have is with my boomer grandma who was like, well, why would you want to teach English in Japan? Japan's expensive to live in. I know because I lived there for two weeks once 50 years ago. If I was to say anything about it would probably be the realization when i was a kid when Uh when i was like well i think our grades are great aren't they like we're a first world country and then i found out that like oh we actually don't perform that well right education wise Mm -hmm. but at the same time we can't overlook the fact that america has such a presence in gdp like it is competing with china of course but like yeah but like GDP. Oh, oh! So the country's economy is doing really well, but is it a nice place to live? I don't care Not about GDP if if the roads don't work. <laughs> if, uh, if 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 milk costs fifteen dollars a gallon, I'm not going to care about GDP. We're getting to that point, right? The dystopian future where uh, Domino's is fixing the roads. Yeah, <laughs> uh, the idiocracy um, future yeah. is coming true. Where they, they water plants with Brondo. <laughs> Yeah. Dude, it's what plants crave. Yeah. <laughs> I was so mad when we were talking about uh we were talking about growing plants and we didn't mention to water them with Brondo. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's got what plants crave. Yeah. The next point, uh I think we can both agree that that uh, giant corporations generate and use propaganda extensively. Oh yeah. Advertising. Definitely. Um, like, I think they're actually advertising laws, especially in regards to kids. Like you can only do so much. Interesting. But, uh, like everybody's skirting the lines. Um, yeah, there's like TV spots for like, yes, on prop, whatever. I've definitely seen a lot of that, but I don't really pay attention to what laws are specific where I just know they do it. Yeah. There are media laws determining how much you can advertise and like how much time can be spent. I think it's like 30% of a, uh, that's still huge. Yeah. Like 30% of a program can be used for advertisement purposes. Uh Uh-huh. Then it brought up a real weird question where are YouTubers, are they included in those advertising laws? Interesting. The internet, at least for a while was the kind of the wild west. Now it's been very sanitized, but yeah, like we're going to have to figure out, um, how, much is too much when it comes to advertising on the internet. Yeah, because at some point it becomes predatory to uh, children. 
Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's um there was a big ad apocalypse a couple of years ago on the on YouTube because specifically that. I think that's still going on to a degree. And as far as like the propaganda, we've seen we've all seen like those those corporate videos of like it's fun to work at corporation, that kind of stuff. Maybe at like Google, you know. Google, yeah, where they like uh let's see, they have like slides in their I've never been to the Google campus. I hear it's pretty weird. It's uh interesting because like they don't have traditional offices, right? Right. Like they do, but they don't. Yeah. Like you don't have to work in your traditional office. You can go to like a cafe space and work there within the building. Yeah, and that is quite interesting. I wonder how effective it is. I hear it's fairly effective. I mean, they are Google. Yeah, they they're doing certainly doing well for themselves. Oh, big news. I can't believe we even skipped past this. What? What is it? Uh, Microsoft's acquisition. Uh, let's let's talk about this uh, that some other time. Okay. Well, yeah. it just happened. It's just kind of big news. Yeah, yeah. We can we can talk about that next time. Um uh, another like tool of propaganda Hollywood. Duh. Yeah. Easy. Like no, I think uh would you say like now more than ever normies are super embracing Hollywood? Oh, definitely. Uh the Marvel heads. Marvel Marvel plebs. Um Every franchise under the sun being turned into a movie and rebooted. Mm-hmm. We've definitely talked about how like modern movies are just kind of popcorn for the masses stuff, right. but you know, in many cases, it's overtly being used to push a, a particular political agenda. And in the case of the Marvel movies, it's 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 pretty much just like, don't pay attention to politics. Watch Iron Man uh, snap his snap the Infinity Gauntlet. Watch that instead. Watch quirky characters do yeah. socially acceptable things. Right. It's, like, it's lost a lot of its, uh, like, kind of moral morality questions uh-huh. that come with superheroes, right? Well, it, it's not even necessarily about teaching morals so much as it is about making billions of dollars in China now. They, ma- they make the thing that's most widely appealing, take absolutely no risks in doing it. Uh, the Star Wars franchise fell victim to this. I mean, really, always Star Wars has always been kind of a, a merch moving franchise, but the Disney Star Wars is even more so. Uh, but on Bond, uh, re- returning back to our subject of the evening, n- the next point: encourage you to spy and report on the misconduct of others. Yep. Yep. The whole, this is the whole role of HR. I actually was in charge of implementing a training for this really do tell yeah it was um what is it so it actually is involved in cybersecurity to a degree it was uh what was it spotting malicious actors interesting so what you were uh you were training for is more like an anti-corporate espionage thing rather than say a kind of social control if someone appears to be very displeased with their work and would like to do damage to the company. Oh yeah. That could definitely um, like accuse them of being a corporate spy and fire them essentially. Uh, Say like, Hey, this person is potentially a risk to the company. Uh It would be wise to keep an eye on them or like report their actions if they have done something. Oh, yeah, yeah. So even like a disgruntled employee, um, even Correct. if they're not knowing any other. Not necessarily fire them, but keep an eye on them. They yeah, can yeah. Cause of like a data leak. Granted, you can always bring up the argument that literally everybody is a security risk, but. Yeah, yeah. Well, because because companies try to indoctrinate loyalty into their employees, some people are less of a security risk than others. And, and I guess I guess speaking of of leaks. Uh, forbids you from speaking with ex-members and critics. Um, a lot of cults do this. It's called excommunication. Basically, if you leave the cult, you're not allowed to talk to members of your family. And that's one of the ways that cults retain members is because people who leave suddenly don't have any social network. They're suddenly on their own because all their family is still in the cult. 
this is not strong in corporate America, especially if the ex-member quit amicably, but I have seen this attitude about people who were fired from jobs where I worked. And in Asia, uh, I know in Japan, this is absolutely the case, where if you quit a job and you start working for a competitor, it's seen as a betrayal. <laughs> it's, uh, when I was working at, you know, a place where I felt like I was not very good at it, uh-huh. I definitely hated the job, but not necessarily... I wasn't trying to be bad at it. I know. I can actually think of an example of this. Imagine what your company would think if they knew you were browsing the anti-work subreddit. Okay, well, let's start with how cringe that is, okay? Anti-work got super cringe, but uh, j- just just being on anti-work would be probably a fireable offense. Like, the oh, you you don't fit in with our company image or something. And the real reason is is you've been browsing anti-work. Or, like, if either of our companies found out we were doing this podcast. Yeah, that's that's why we use aliases and yeah. hide some of the facts, right? Mm-hmm. So that's that's uh, one example. Uh, and this is this is this next example, I guess it's still in the realm of information, but discourages access to non-cult sources of information. And the best example I can think here is science. With like strong quotations, yeah, strong quotations. There's there's definitely like a normie pattern of scientists having an approved opinion, and to go against that opinion is science denial, even if other credible scientists uh, disagree with that. Um, never mind that scientists has said some very wrong and harmful things in the past, and science has been used to harm people in the past. No, science is the is the end all be all, and just just look at how normies treated Dr. Fauci. Back when this whole coof thing began, oh the uh, the the science worshipper, I have... yeah the science worshipper, yeah the the Santa denier, yeah the your your typical Santa denier, the mental gymnastics, uh huh, <laughs> in, involved with Santa denial, yeah right. Uh, it's simple, you know. He Santa uses his magic and delivers presents to everybody. I don't mm-hmm. know what's so difficult about that, but instead it's. All the corporations are involved. Um, Parents are all just in agreement that Santa is real. Uh, (laughs) Somehow, these presents end up in everybody's... Uh Under everybody's tree at night. (laughs) Okay. okay. Disappear. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, can you think of any other examples apart from from science? Um, Let me think. I guess maybe the story of of people who didn't follow the normie narrative ended up successful anyway. Um, those are always kind of shot down as like, oh, well, he just got lucky, stuff like that. I think uh, schools are definitely involved. Yeah, mm-hmm. the schools definitely have a certain way they want you to think and behave. Right, because, I mean, it feels like up until my first year of college, everybody told me, like, unless you go to college, you're going to be a you know, a bum worker. Yes, that's absolutely true. The, the, there's never the story about the, the guy who dropped out of high school and became very wealthy and successful. That, that, that's always he got lucky or something like that. Another example I can think of is in college, um, this idea that there is a list of approved sources of information that you mm-hmm. can cite on essays and projects. Right. Uh, you can't use Wikipedia, even though Wikipedia has cited sources. Right. Well, it's it's like... Um, let's see, as an English major, you, you are hit with this a lot more, but it's like only this, this particular list. I, if I remember right, you were an art student. And so citing your sources wasn't quite as important for you as it was for me. Nope. I just had to cite my inspirations. Like for me, even if a source was credible, like I could quote a PhD and if he wasn't considered in the in circle, then he wasn't considered a credible source and I could not cite what he said. Like the only points I was allowed to make were those that were kind of pre-approved by the education ivory tower that is university. Yep, that adds up. And again, here are the things that were kind of tougher to fit in, but I'm putting them here for posterity and to pad out the episode. Um, divide information into outsider versus insider doctrine. Yeah, can you think of any for that? Let me think. Divine information outside insider versus outsider doctrine. 
I wish I came up with like examples used in actual cults. I guess I guess the best one would be like the Xenu thing in Scientology. I, I'm fairly certain there's something Rajneesh Purim did for this as well. Yeah, but I'm having trouble thinking of specific examples. Like the cult will believe a certain thing, but then deny to non-believers that this is the case. Uh, only the inner circle can really uh, acknowledge that this is a belief, a part of their belief system. Uh, I, I guess, I guess it's hard to think of examples in the norm because I couldn't think of any. <laughs> it, it's hard to put one together, but I know they exist. I can, like, I'm certain they exist. Use information gained from confession sessions against you, and that requires a confession session in the first place. Um, I think, like, the best one I can think of is, like, when you're called in for some kind of infraction at your job and they make you sign the paper. <laughs> so, like, effectively signing the paper is the confession that you did the thing, and then they use that later to fire you. That's the best example I can think of. You're told to do the right thing, right? Every time you're told that if you, the consequences will be much less severe if you just come clean, and then they're, like, as severe as they can get at a job. Uh -huh. going to prison. Right, they're, they're making a case against you. Okay. Next point, gaslight you to make you doubt your own memory. Uh, Again, I, I can't say I've ever been gaslit. I know companies do it. I've yeah. definitely heard stories of people being gaslit by their boss. It's just never happened to me. Right, it's it definitely happens, but I think this uh -huh. is a person basis. We can't really frame this as jobs in general. Or, or just like the way that normies kind of think, right? It doesn't have to be jobs. Right. Um, and require you to report thoughts, feelings, and activities to superiors. Again, not sure. Um, I think this is definitely person to person. Yeah, like job to job, person to person. There, there are some that definitely apply to every job I've been to, but uh -huh. I don't, again, I'm not sold on them being a cult per se. We're only halfway through the bite model, and the episode is almost an hour long. We're going to split this episode into two parts, and we'll be back next time with the rest of the discussion on the normie cult. For now, thanks for listening all the way through to the end. If you like what you heard, you can help us grow in a few ways. We're still rather small and trying to grow out the audience, so if you have friends who might be interested in the neat work, let them know about us. All boosts to our signal help, and we treasure every new subscriber. If you're listening on Podbean or any other fine podcasting service that hosts the neat work, leave a like and consider downloading the episode. If you're listening on YouTube, you can like, subscribe, and leave a comment to help out the algorithm. It only takes a moment and you're helping out a lot more than you think. And until next time, good night and stay comfy.